Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Wrench Turners podcast. Today we have a fixed ops trainer in a slightly different way than you're used to talking about. Usually they're consultants out in the wild. They usually have a, a big conglomerate around them, but this this is an individual doing it very specifically. And I, I can't wait to, to share this story with you. His name is Wayne Bridges. And today on the Wrench Turners podcast, the show that's sort of improving the life, well-being, and productivity mechanics everywhere, we're going to get into what he does with training. Wayne, thank you very much for joining us on the show. Thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Wayne, now, I, I really appreciate one big shout out that I want to make sure that everybody hears. Wayne has been following along a long time. He is active in the conversations that we have on a regular basis with all the content, whether it's on the podcast or, or content on LinkedIn or what have you. I really appreciate your feedback, your insights, your experience really, really shows that conversation really needs to be had on everything we're talking about, whether it's mental health, training, productivity, the across the board, the conversation needs to be had, not the, the constant belligerent complaining stuff that some folks tend to do. Yep. Yep. I hear you. No. So let's, let's tuck into this. Um, let's, let's do what we always do. Let's, let's start with the beginning. What got you into automotive in the first place? Okay. Well, it started in 1962. I was uh, five years old, and my uh, my dad loaded all of us up into the car. Uh, we were living in Lawton, Oklahoma. He was uh, stationed at Fort Still, still uh, in the Army. And he loaded us in the car and took us to the A&W uh, root beer uh, place that was a drive-in. And so I'm sitting in there, all, my, all excited to be there, excited to get my root beer float. And a brand new 1962 Corvette pulled in next to us. And I totally forgot about my root beer float. I was so enthralled with that car. And that's when I fell in love with automobiles. And uh, um, it just grew from there. Um, when I was 10 years old, I decided I wanted to be an auto mechanic. Um, and that has been my focus my entire life is to be in the automotive industry. My, my dream was to be a Chevrolet mechanic. And uh, my first job out of trade school was at a Chevrolet dealership in 1977. And it was pretty cool. Um, so, you know, I just grew up playing around with cars. My dad worked on all of the family cars. So I was always out there helping him, uh, you know, handing him wrenches. And then eventually he started having me do all the grunt work that he didn't want to do, you know, pulling those nasty starters off and things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, and then I graduated to working on all the kids' bicycles in the neighborhood and then their mini bikes and things like that. And um, around about high school time, I realized I could take parts on and off, but I had no idea how any of those things worked, what the theory was behind it. And uh, my dad always had to figure out what was wrong with the car. And then I would, you know, do the grunt work for it. So, so uh, my senior year in high school, I got myself enrolled in a local you know, automotive trade school um, and, uh, you know, learned the theory behind automotive. And, uh, and it really, uh, I guess, saved me because I, I was a, I was a troubled youth and, uh, you know, made a lot of bad decisions. Um, hated school, you know, um, if I was in school, I probably had my hot rod magazine tucked inside my, you know, my school book. Um, and, you know, if I had something better to do, yeah, I probably didn't go to school, you know. Um, but then I got into vocational school and that's where uh, my passion and the education met. And mm -hmm. I was, you know, after two years of uh, going to school, I graduated as the top student in my class. Um, I missed exactly one day of school in two years. Um, I missed one question on all the tests and, and uh, you know, assignments that I had to turn in and stuff like that. Because now everything I was learning, that math and all of those things that I hated in school, had a direct relation to something that I loved. And uh, so, um, you know, I, it worked out pretty good. Um, while I was at, in the, the trade school, I actually, my very first job was as a mechanic at a Kawasaki motorcycle shop. And awesome. 
Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I loved motorcycles, too. I raced motorcycles, uh, both um, motocross and drag race motorcycles in my youth and stuff. Um, so, yeah, so while I was in school, I was, uh, you know, um, working on motorcycles and things like that. Uh, but right about the time I graduated, I got the opportunity to go to work at that Chevrolet dealership, and it was pretty cool. Um, That's pretty awesome. So, yeah. you've gone, so you got into cars simply, you know, the first time you saw it, the kind of car that just kind of got the blood flowing, that, that yeah. ignited the fire. You've got somebody who's in your family, your father working on cars, and then you get into school to, to do some more working on cars and, and education and so on and so forth. And while you're doing that, you're working on motorcycles and cars and all the rest of that, and then you end up with a, at, a, at a Chevy dealership. So that's that's pretty clear, consistent. Now, one of the, the cool things in there, you said you raced motorcycles drag and motocross those are two completely different disciplines yeah was the was the racing something that was part of that love or was that something that you wanted to do to so maybe you could fix the racing stuff or was it more hobby uh, as an association of yeah it was more of a hobby it was it was fun at the time and uh you know i I like fast stuff. I like going fast. Uh, um, I'm, I, I tend to be kind of an extreme person. You know, I've jumped out of perfectly good airplanes and, and <laughs> I've hang glide and, you know, I, I scuba dived. And um, the only thing I didn't do was bungee jump because I had already gotten married and the wife said no to that. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I like living life to the fullest and uh, I like having fun. And, and fortunately for me, I ended up in an industry that I love. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm in my 50th year in the automotive business professionally. And I haven't regretted a day of it. And, uh, you know, I've been able to progress through, um, you know, I started out as that apprentice level technician in the shop, um, not knowing anything. You know, I came out of school, top of the class, and I thought I'm all that and found out, no, I wasn't. Um, I think most of us tend to do that. Some some yeah. don't grow out of that phase. Well, yeah, some, yeah. some don't grow out of that phase, but some of us get humbled, really realize it's like, Okay, sometimes school does a really good job at preparing us for, for what real life is like. And then it was like, oh, we're prepared. And then you get into the real world and new, no, 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 I am not even remotely prepared for what reality of life on the shop floor yeah. is. So can, yeah. let's, let's dig into that a little bit because that's mm -hmm. the reason why it's one of the questions that I ask consistently of all the guests is that it really – exemplifies how different things can can be but at the same time how similar they can also be that first year on the shop floor it doesn't matter whether you did school first or not that first year on the shop floor kind of can seems to kind of dictate what your capabilities are later in life in yeah. in the shop because for from technicians that I've experienced through coaching or on the show they the ones that had it really poorly off that didn't have a great mentor or a great uh, a service leader tend to be slightly more negative about the industry. And the ones that had a really great first year tend to be the ones that are high achievers, overachievers, uh, high value leaders, or people who go down specialist routes um, and achieve great things. So that first year is really important. So I'd love to hear what your first year in that Chevy dealership was like. Yeah, well, it, and it's it's a pretty pretty interesting story because um, I was the first person that the service manager hired out of school directly to be a technician. He always put you on lubrac first, and then transitioned you in the shop. But I came in with such high praise from my teachers. Um, I had recommendations from some other people, uh, and so he hired me. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm pretty stoked about that. I'm working in the shop and um, six months later, the boss comes up to me one morning and he, he's adjusting my collar and he says, Wayne, um, we're moving you to the lube rack. <laughs> and I go, oh. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, the boss goes, uh, you seem to have a problem with this, Wayne. And I go, well, yeah, you know, you're demoting me. And he goes, you haven't this. You you have a choice here, Wayne. 
you can either accept this as a learning and uh, experience and opportunity, or you can be grumpy and go somewhere else. That's your choice. And uh, so I chose to go ahead and go on to Lubrac. And I'll tell you what, that was the best thing that could have happened to me because I went into this shop and um, as my, my dad would have said, I was like a fart in a skillet. I just bounced everywhere. OK, I ran to the parts department. I ran to the bathroom. I ran to the parking lot to get the car. Uh, but I had no order in the way I worked on a car, the way I diagnosed it and how I repaired it. I'd work on one side for a little while and then I'd bounce over the other side and work on it. And then I'd come back over to the other side and work again. And getting put on that lube rack taught me how to start at one place and finish at the other place and not waste any effort. And so that's many... such a key learning tool for young apprentices, young mechanics coming into the industry. We've had multiple, multiple people, all ages, all experience levels, all comment on something similar where once you figure out your own process that falls within, shall we say, the repair guidelines, as it were. But mm -hmm. once you find your own process, you dig down deep and that becomes it becomes your own internal foundation of anything you build on. Yeah. Um, for example, Zach Perkel, Boys and the 10 mil, they all started at, they all start the same tire. doesn't matter what they're doing, their entire inspection process or their t entire repair process, or they're doing a basic oil change and tire rotation. They always start at the same wheel and they go in the same direction. It didn't matter what shop they moved to. It didn't matter which bay they moved to or, or whatever the car is. doesn't matter. They would all st always start in the same place. And the right. series of steps that they would go through are the same thing over and over again. You want to do it so you no longer have to think. Mm -hmm. The challenge there is, as well, as you can probably also uh, verify, that you don't want to get to a place of complacency where you're no longer mm -hmm. thinking. Yeah. You want to get it so that it's almost like it's second nature, like you're not thinking. You are. You have to use your brain to make sure you're doing all the steps properly. But you want to get it to a point where you're almost not thinking because then that, that's when the things come quickly. Right. It also becomes kind of boring. And like we say on a regular basis on the show, it's the boring stuff that makes us the money. Exactly. Right? The challenging stuff can also make us a lot of money, but you've got to get really, 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 really good at the boring stuff so that the challenging stuff then can make you make you some money yeah. as well. Yeah. So let's let's dig into that a little bit more. So you got demoted, as it yeah. were. Um, this is a humbling experience mm -hmm. that you went through. Yeah. I can't say that I haven't been through something like that before the the concept of 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 being told very um I won't say eloquently is probably the wrong word but ineloquently or dumbly I don't even know what the right phrase is but being told by the owner of the collision store that um you no longer work here because you can't lead the people in the, on this team and then finding out that Going through all the motions of all the emotions of of being let go. I'm I'm young man. This is what feels like forever ago still. But these are the things that you need to go through. I didn't know. Like it was my first. It was not, actually it was my second leadership role, and I'd been doing it for almost you know a year and a half. We were we were getting on two years. You're not leading well. Out the door you go. Humbling. Incredibly humbling experience made me reflect on all the decisions I've made, all of the, the journaling I've done and, and go back in those kinds of those humbling experiences. You can, like you said, you can either take You can either learn from it, which is stay and go to lube rack or not learn from, from it and be grumpy. Right. right. I didn't have the opportunity to stay in the business and, and do something slightly differently, but I digress. It was a learning opportunity for me. So you went to the lube rack. And you said it was one of the, the greatest things that happened for you very specifically. Why? Well, because I, I had to learn how to work efficiently. I, you know, like you were talking about, start at one wheel and finish at the other wheel. You no know, bouncing around back and forth and things like that. Um, and you develop those processes. You know, we, we talk about processes. Those are important in every part of life and every part of the automotive industry. You know, we have processes of how we're going to uh, process our customers through our dealership. You know, our advisors have to follow certain process. 
And it's the same thing with fixing a car. We, we have to have that process. And so that helped me develop that process. And like you said, you get good and now you don't have to think so hard. You know, it, it's, it's like piano players just blow me away. That person that is just a, a really good piano player, they're sitting there playing this beautiful piece of music, and then they're carrying on a conversation with you. Because mm -hmm. that piece of music is so ingrained in them, they can do it and do something else. And and that's where we get on fixing cars. When we get really good at those tasks that get really boring, like you said, but we can we can think differently. Um, we can think about other things while we're doing it. Um, we can think of better ways of doing what we're doing. You know, we've been doing it like this for a while, but we've gotten comfortable. But all of a sudden we decide, ah, maybe this is a better way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, I think that's, that's really critical. Um, and, you know, the, the really critical thing in all parts of life is to never stop learning and never stop being challenged. And what happens is you mentioned the word complacency. That's what happens to us so often is we get older, we get complacent and um, we get comfortable and we don't want to be challenged anymore. We just want things to go along easy peasy. Man, I'm not, I'm not cut from that kind of cloth. Um, I, I need new experiences. I need new challenges. Um, you know, I, being in the automotive industry today is this is the coolest time to be in the industry. We've got the fastest, most efficient, safest cars on the planet that have ever been built. Now, I like old classics. You know, um, I, you know, I own a 1959 Morris Minor. It's a cool little mm -hmm. truck to drive around. But I don't want to drive that every day. Um, you know, I want that car that's comfortable and safe and dependable. Um, and, uh, you know, we get to use the greatest technology and, uh, it's, it's, it's a cool time to be in the industry. It really is a really cool time in the industry. And, and you bring up the old classic cars and the old classic bikes and things of that nature. And, and you think about, you know, I saw a meme the other day, you know, there was a, I think it was a seventies challenger at the stoplight with a Tesla next to it. And and the, the the quote at the top of the caption at the top is, in 50 years, nobody's going to restore a Tesla. And they're probably very right. They're probably very, very right. But when you look at the in the terms of performance, the safety, the handling, all of the features that come with a Tesla, you look at the difference between the two. I like the way the Teslas are styled. Yeah. And I think I like the, I like the test the way that the Teslas, especially the, the brand new ones, you look at the plaids and the wide body and all the rest of it, they just look absolutely spectacular. Yeah, yeah. And you put it next to a, like a 70s Challenger, one of my favorite cars of all time. What does the Challenger have over the Tesla? Genuinely speaking, and be, and be objective about it. Mm -hmm. Noise. Yeah. Noise and, it. noise and nostalgia. Noise and nostalgia. Now, is there something about being able to do a, a, a wheelie in a 70s Challenger? Absolutely. That's not something a Tesla is ever going to do. It's just yeah. never going to do it because you've got 4,000 pounds or 5,000 pounds worth of batteries. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's not going to happen. It's going to accelerate like a scalded cat, yep. just like the 70s Challenger will, but it's going to do it silently. There's something <laughs> visceral about getting into an old car. It doesn't even have to be an old car. My, my 2004 SRT4 made an absolute wonderful noise there's something visceral about that that we lose in in electricity now you get gain that back in handling i said handling and safety yeah. and things of that nature but we're progressing for a reason and whether you like evs or not i'm not a super big proponent as a ev for everyone kind of deal mm -hmm. right now just for lots of different reasons but at the same time Let's look at everything. Can they be complex? Yes. Is there is that part of the challenges why some folks are no longer coming in or staying in the industry? Yes, it is. Is it the only reason? No. And what I'd like to do is, you know, 1907. So you said 1977, I think, was when you said you were was your first year at the Chevy store. Correct. Am I correct? Did I get that correct. right? The 77. OK, so from 77 till 2024. You have seen a lot of changes. You've seen <laughs> the rise and fall of the big block. 
You've seen the the rise in in onslaught of emissions regulations, which completely d- gutted big blocks and even small blocks for mm-hmm. a, a very long period of time. Yep. You've seen the big introduction of turbochargers, yep. uh, the big introduction of front wheel drive, and then subsequently as well as all wheel drive. Mm-hmm. You've then seen the onslaught of hybrids coming in, and that now EVs. Would you say the transition to full EVs from a mechanic standpoint was the biggest transition? Or was it going from unregulated uh, internal combustion to full emissions componentry or something else? What would you say? Yeah, that's a that's a good question, Joshua. Um, I like that. Um, I think, you know, I started out in the industry and um, – HEI, electronic ignition, was only a couple years old when I started out. Mm-hmm. And and then we got these newfangled computer-controlled carburetors, and we had a computer in that car. But we couldn't uh-huh. talk to it. You know, I could I could oh, yeah. plug a wire in, and the light would blink at me and tell me that it has this trouble code and stuff. I, I think probably that transition from the non-computer to the, to the computerized – was probably the biggest jump, and then it's just been it's been really linear. Then, right? I'm sorry, say that again. Been explosive learning and, and complexity since then. Correct. Yeah. So you know, it's kind of like the in- introduction of the internet. You know, mm-hmm. um, you know, it used to you know you had to listen to all the buzzes and beeps and stuff like that while it was booting up, and and you couldn't do anything real fast, and and now. You know, it's just, whew, it's mind boggling. You know, I get, I got this cell phone here that is more powerful than most of the computers I've had, you know, in, in my life, you know? Uh, so yeah, I think it was the jump from non-computerized to computerized um, was the biggest change and caused the, the biggest problem for technicians of time. Um, and then, uh, then it's just been very linear. I think, um, you know, n- almost like a near vertical line. <laughs> yeah, 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 pretty close. Yeah, um, and the you know the hybrid electric, um, you know, well, it's been around you know twenty five years now. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, it, it came on, and we think it came on fast, but it didn't. You know, it, if if people know their history. You know, Ferdinand Porsche's first car that he built was an electric car. The second mm-hmm. car he built was a hybrid gas electric, uh, you know, vehicle. You mm-hmm. know, it, it, they've been playing with it forever, but because of the the computer processing speed we have now, now we can perfect that and make that vehicle efficient. Um, now we've got to build that inf- infrastructure to support it, and and can we do that without ruining? The rest of our planet, you know that. Yeah. You know, that's 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 kind of presenting a lot of different challenges in yeah. terms of logistics and minerals and all of the different complexities that go along with yeah. getting all of this stuff and the componentry and the sizes and the weights and the safeties and yeah. the um yeah there's lots of there's lots of very very rare instances of things going very wrong there's you know but the the opportunities there are, are very you know there's very real opportunities mm-hmm. there for yeah. EVs. Yeah. And you know what, the as Elon regularly says, the rate of innovation has to increase for our species to become interplanetary. And one of those things is figuring out how to how to adequately use battery power in some some capacity. We've got to figure out how to how to do those things, and it's all kinds of complicated and all kinds of all kinds of all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, but specifically, I I remember you know, being in the shop 2001-ish, like almost 25 years ago. And I remember talking about, you know, if I I get this right, maybe my time's a little bit off and correct me in the comments, ladies and gentlemen. But 2001, I think Toyota had the Prius. And, you know, that's a long time ago. You know, you talk about Elon starting Tesla, I think 2005, I could be wrong, but like 2004, 2005, when I remember seeing like, I think it was the Shelby Cobra. He he put a, a an electric battery and an electric motor in a Shelby Cobra or something like that. And you know, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that's happened in a lot of years. So it it really hasn't come on quickly, like no. just like you said. Now we have all kinds of complicated stuff going now. You've got Rimac and Rivian and Tesla, and you've got um, there's this Canadian uh, Canadian company. 
I'm not even sure if it's a full Canadian company, but there's a, um, I walked through the, and this is, I'm going down a rabbit hole, so bear with me. Um, I was in the mall, um, a mall in, in Toronto a couple of weeks back when my wife was, um, in just recovering from surgery, I couldn't do anything and, and she was going through all stuff. So I, I went to the mall and picked up some stuff and, and got some food for her to bring her back. So she could have a real meal. And, uh, I'm walking through the mall and there's not only one, which is crazy to me, but there is two dealerships in the mall. And Ooh. one is a Tesla and one is this other brand that I, right now it is completely bothering me that I can't recall it, but you've got dealerships in a mall. In a mall. Yeah. That's crazy to me. And they could do that. And they could just drive them through the mall because they're full electric. Yeah. So like the complexities of this stuff is just changing incredibly. But that leads me to the next portion. What complexities have occurred let's say in the last 10 years of your career, you know, in terms of leadership, in terms of working, in terms of training and, and, you know, basically what's happened between 77 and now. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, we still have some of that mechanical, you know, stuff that we have to do, but there, there is so much, you know, the electrical diagnostics, electrical electronic diagnostics, um, you know, it, you, you've got a car that the uh, you have no throttle response and it might be something wrong with the engine. It might be something long, wrong with the vehicle stability control, call it causing you not to have any throttle response. <laughs> you know, so it's it's, uh, you know, looking at all those uh, those packages. And, and that's where it's so critical to stay on top of what's happening in the industry and, uh, you know, um, making sure you're trained up. And, uh, you know, and that gets back to the employers, making sure that they see the value in training their technicians and keeping them on that cutting edge. Um, you know, that that's definitely historically been a problem in our industry. You know, they uh, they expect us to, to be able to, you know, go from, you know, changing spark plugs or doing an oil change to diagnosing ADOS problems and things like that with no training. Um, mm -hmm. Working on this hybrid electric vehicle with no training. Um, and uh, um, I think I kind of, kind of swayed off of what your original question was, um, but, um, I, that's just a really important thing to me is, is, is the training side of it. Um, I've so been, let's, let's, let's dig into that. It's okay. Let's, let's dig into that a little bit more. So from 77 a day, what are the trains, maybe one, two training points that you would say that, uh, technicians need to be mindful of that, that may not be normal because, I say regularly, I say as many times in an episode, every episode as I possibly can, that training is probably the single most important thing for a technician, bar none, that that dictates their paycheck. Right. Bar none dictates right. the paycheck. Even more so than attitude, I would suggest, because I find that if you get all of the training, once you have the training and start utilizing the training, attitude can, sh can shift on its own because you become more confident and capable of the things you're doing. Sure. Now, that's when attitude then sets in. And if you don't have a good attitude, it doesn't matter how much training that you do have. But at least if you get all of the training you need first, you have less hurdles to overcome to be successful. Yeah. So what would you say is maybe one or two things over that last 40 years, 50 years that may have been pivotal in terms of training for you or for people that you've trained because you're now training technicians um, that you would say is impactful? Um, I, I don't know if this is exactly the answer, but it, but it's that hunger for, for learning that hunger for training. Um, you know, um, you may be in a, in a business that is not investing in your training. That doesn't mean that you as a person can't be proactive and, and get that training yourself. Um, that, and, that right there. That is that is a bar right there. We say it regularly on 10 mil. We say it regularly on the show. That is the that that's what I wanted to hear. 
Just because your employer isn't necessarily investing in training for you does not mean you can't invest in training for yourself. And especially today, because there's so many resources available that that won't necessarily cost you money. You may need to to get the really good training. You may need to uh, you know spend some money of your own, but you need to think of that just like buying that new piece of equipment, that new you know that new tool that's going to make your job faster. We do that without blinking an eye. Um, but employers do the same thing. They'll buy a piece of equipment for us to do our job faster, but they don't look at the training in the same way of, of a, as an investment in that employer. Um, and that's one thing that I, when I'm, when I have the opportunity to talk to employers, that I really stress that, that this training that you're, you're spending money on for this technician is no different than buying that new fancy schmancy alignment machine that you have to amortize over X amount of years to understand you're getting a return on the investment. Well, training is the same way. That you're not going to get an immediate, you know, uh, return on investment. You have to look at it from the long term. And you invest in that technician and um, they're going to become more efficient and make you more money. And oh, by the way, they're probably going to be happier and more um, loyal to you uh, as that goes as well. Because agreed, it, it's a cool thing about relationship. The cool thing about training is that if you have somebody who wants the training, especially mm -hmm. if they've got the right attitude, if they want the training, and they learn something, that is not an amortized over a period of time thing at, like a like a, a, a um like an alignment rack like you suggested is it's not it's not the same thing you're not spending sixty thousand dollars one time right and amortizing it over it's significantly less mm -hmm. to do you know spot training on all kinds of things across the year yeah some some folks need a whole lot of training up front and you know as time progresses they need fewer instances of training across the year but it's not 60 grand every year right right and and secondly when when you go look at it from from a foundational point each series of piece of training regardless of what's about whether it's communication whether it's new uh, processes whether it's new product um, new techniques they all build because you look at a alignment machine it's a one and done you can you either can or you cannot do alignments Versus training where you might need 10 different pieces of training in order to get to the 11th. And if you don't have one through 10, the 11th is going to be irrelevant. So you have to start stacking. But the stack of training number one now allows you to do this much. And then training number two and number one allow you to do this much and this much and this much as you grow. And it's an exponential value. Yeah. Because the processes that you learn at training at levels like that means that you grow your capability exponentially. Yeah. More things to fix, more products to fix, more different capabilities. One of the things that came up, and again, I'm doing a little bit of a rabbit hole, but one of the things that came up recently in a conversation was recon. You know, you, we have large dealerships that sometimes outsource to a recon focused facility. There's nothing wrong with that where you have a recon facility where they generally hire independent repair facility technicians to fulfill those roles because they are used to working on all different makes and models. But if you have a, not necessarily a large group or a large store where you do every, all your recon in-house, you have to have technicians that can not only fix the brand functionally really well, they also have to be able to do all kinds of off-brand things as well. And you need more than just brand training to be able to do that successfully at scale. So that building on training, building on training, and building on training. And it gets even deeper than that. And this is, and this is that conversation, and I, like, I have a question to follow up with this. When you do recon in your facility as a dealership, it allows you to then pick and choose. Sometimes you have technicians that you know, had a really hard week. Like by, by Thursday afternoon, you know, they've only got maybe 30 hours under the belt. Maybe throw them a couple of recons. Yeah. But if they don't have the training to do the recon as exceptionally as well as everybody else that does recon on a regular basis, they're not going to succeed. Yeah. So the opportunities come with more training right. to that effect. What is, what is the, the kind of training that you're focused on doing right now? When, before I 
touch on that. I just wanted to mention one other thing related to the, you know, especially the employer side of the training. Um, I don't know up in Toronto what it's like, but down here in the in the U.S., um, it, it just blows my mind how many employers don't know this. But you can deduct $5,250 every single year for every employee in your in your business for training that's related to their job skills. You can deduct that from your from your taxes. Is that a is that a, a municipal, state, or federal deduction? That is a federal deduction from your federal taxes, and so many employers don't know about that. And I I, I just I'm always trying to get that word out to employers um, that you can do that. And so um, yeah, so I just wanted to get that out. So you heard it here, folks. Make sure you check it. Check in with your accountant. See if you're not, if you are, or you are not already taking advantage of this kind of training. Uh, a, a stipend, grant, stipend, no, grant, no. It, it's just a tax write-off. Yeah. Tax write-off. Check into it, folks. If you're not taking advantage of it, you need to be taking advantage of it. I don't know what the current number is uh, here in Canada because our state, you know, you look at state versus province and, and federal versus federal. There's going to be all kinds of different things. And I know if there is something like that here in Canada, and I don't know if there is currently, there wasn't um, several years ago, the last time I looked into labor and training uh, from inside a, a dealership. And the reason that is in Canada, because we have the apprentice program. So there is a lot of tax uh, write offable business expense offable kind of things while a technician is still an apprentice during that, you know, three to four, three to five year period of time where uh, employers can take advantage of those kinds of write-offs. As soon as they become a licensed technician up here in Canada, many, near all of those taxable benefits, both from an employee and employer, go out the door. It's asinine, but that is the cost of doing business, as it were, for being exceptionally subsidized. So, for example, in the U.S., um, many of the states uh, where I've talked to um, employers and many of the, the states across the country, your schools aren't subsidized. Ours is. So, for example, for for me, even going back 20 years, 20, 20 years, yeah, 20 years when I went to automotive school, I only paid four hundred dollars for what is two months, two solid full day months of school. Four hundred dollars. That was it. That's all I paid, and I got subsidized by the government as well. So the the college got subsidized for the tuition, so to speak, and I got subsidized by the government for pay because I I can go on unemployment during that two period two week period of time, and the employer yes they're out they don't have me for those two months, but their only obligation is to the, whatever the stipend is to pay for unemployment because you have an employee technically on unemployment, but is it that is a tax write-off because of the way that functionally works. So it's heavily subsidized up here during the apprentice program. So maybe that might be the offset for your training long-term. I don't know, but definitely do your due diligence. Yeah. So you're, you, you've got that, that stipend down there. So what is, so getting back into it, what is the training that you're doing right now specifically? So I've, I've got two different classes that I'm teaching here at our dealership. Um, um, we, we have our Toyota Express Maintenance Technicians. That, that's our lube rack, okay? Mm -hmm. um, we, have, uh, we have 20 of them, and um, we split them up. And so um, three days a week, I'm giving classes, um, hour-long classes, on just basic uh, automotive fundamentals. Uh, most of these guys have had no training. Um, I gave them a little bit of training to get them ready to do their job on Lubrac. But our goal is that every one of those guys at some point will transition into our and become main shop techs. Uh, mm -hmm. So I just I just finished up a engines basics class, how how the internal combustion engine works, lubricating systems and, uh, you know, cooling systems and stuff like that. Just real basic stuff. Um, and now we're doing a bakes, brakes basics class, how the hydraulic system works and what friction is and how to machine rotors and drums and things like that. Um, so, so that's one thing that I'm doing right now. 
And then for our more advanced level techs, um, I'm doing a, um, a, a, a I'm doing the ASE A6 uh, electrical electronics. Uh, I'm doing a 12-week-long a training for the advanced level techs that are preparing to take that test. So we're we're starting with Ohm's law, um, mm -hmm. and you know just uh, just uh, last uh, Friday, um, I, I my dealership sprung and bought me a bunch of uh, uh, little circuit kits. And oh, we, yeah. we, we did, you know, I gave them a handout with the, with the resistors and all of that. We did the math, the Ohm's law and said, here's what the current is and here's what the total resistance is and here's what the voltage drops are across the resistor. And then we built that circuit and we measured it, you know, each, you know, I had them in teams and each team of two had one of these circuit kits and they built that circuit and Oh man, their, their hair was just about on fire, um, you know, because of the, you know, the math and everything. But once they, they measured it and saw that what we did on paper actually happened here. Oh man, mm -hmm. light bulbs went off. And so, oh, I, so, so two things, three things. Awesome. Yeah. To, like awesome to, um, being able to teach visual audio and tactile mm -hmm. in the store is epic. Yep. You're basically converting college level uh, training and education in store on site. That is like next level, my goodness, amazing. Yeah. And then being able to then translate that you're prepping, not, not necessarily just people who are bumming around. They want to get their like, high tier certifications. I want to know how to do this. And the store is providing someone and stuff and resources to actually get to the next level. That, that we don't have anywhere nearly enough happening out in the world right. because this is the stuff that brings people in. You want to talk about, you know, stores that are struggling out there to get folks in the door, to start turning wrenches, to become apprentices. Build your own in-house training program. Yeah. This store has taken someone who's been around the industry for 50 years, taken all of that knowledge, all of that experience, all of those stories and capabilities and educations, and turning it into a place to train the up-and-coming technicians. Literally building a training facility. You are, uh, what's the common phrase in hospitals is, we are a training hospital. That is a training dealership, completely committed to training. Yeah. I am, this is awesome. Yeah, this it, is it's awesome. It's, it's pretty cool, pretty unique. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't touch on all of my career. You know, I, I spent 16 years as a technician, uh, mostly at General Motors, Chevrolet, and Cadillac. Um, but I did other stuff. I was a, I was a service advisor. I was a service manager. I owned my own business for a while, never worked harder and made less money in my whole life. Um, <laughs> um, went back to being a technician and then, and then I, I transitioned out because I thought, I got really frustrated because we were bringing people into the industry and they were totally unprepared. And so I went and uh, this was in uh, 1991. I went and visited one of my old teachers from the trade school that I went to school with because I was thinking, I think I'd like to do that. You know, mm -hmm. and next thing I know, I'm signed up and uh, I actually taught automotive at one of the local uh, technical colleges here for 29 years. So, uh, you know, I was in a unique position to, to do this job here at this dealership because I, I spent so many years as a technician, but then I spent 29 years as a, a very successful instructor. Um, I, you know, I, I won local and national teaching awards. Um, not only can I fix cars, I, I can help people understand how they work and, and help them learn how to fix them. And uh, I retired from that about six years ago. And uh, I actually, I actually helped build an apprenticeship program in Washington State, a registered apprenticeship program. And I ran that for um, four years. 
And then this opportunity at this dealership came up and it was like, this is exactly what the industry needs. An in-house trainer that uh, is focused on helping their technicians be successful. And this, this dealership is very unique. It's a single ownership dealership. They don't have a big conglomerate. It's uh, mm -hmm. Carrie Odeman is a second generation. Her daddy started this dealership in 1970. Um, but she is so committed to her employees and her and her customers that that she felt like my position was a worthwhile investment. And because of that, we have technicians in the shop downstairs that have worked here 38 years, 35 years, 25 years. You don't see that. OK, but because no. because they are they are treated with respect, they 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 are paid you know a reasonable wage and the the employer invests in their future um they stick around and it, that's it's, amazing it's, it's an amazing place it's an amazing place that i am so privileged to work at this dealership wow 38 yeah. years and and how many tech now you had now something that just kind of dawned on me is that uh a little bit ago you had said that you did you say you have 20 bays full of express lane or you have 20 technicians? 20 technicians. They work in teams of two. Yeah. So you have so you have 10 bays of express lane with right. two technicians per bay for express lane. Awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. the way most of the industry needs to start realizing that right. when you have two focus people in express, you're going to more than double their time once you get them trained appropriately and you put in you put in the front load time to getting them trained through that first 90 to 180 days. Right. You right. start making way more money than you expected to do. Mm -hmm. So the next portion is how many – if you've got 20 techs in express lane, how many techs do you have main shop? I think we have 15 main shop. We're not a big dealership. Um, 35 techs in a shop is not a small store, Wayne. <laughs> That's not a small store at all. Thirty-five techs. You're 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 medium for sure, but depending on on your overall throughput, that's medium to large. That's yeah. that's that's healthy. So you've got lots of talent coming in, mm -hmm. and obviously, you know that not everybody's cut out for this industry. Right. Not everybody's cut out for this industry. Let me put my glasses on to say this very clearly. Not everybody is cut out for this industry. Yep. Okay, but. When you have 20 folks in Express who are being pushed as well as supported and pulled through that process, your 15 tech or thereabouts main shop is going to be full of people who are driven, capable, and trained. Yep, yep. So your customer experience is going to go through the roof because everything's done in-house. Your training's done in-house. Realistically speaking, you only have yourselves to blame for your success and your failures because you're doing everything in-house. Which is the best way you can possibly look at it because it means that you can control processes. If something's not working, you can go, hold up, wait a minute, let's make a change. Yeah. This isn't working, let's fix it. Or this is working really, 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 really well. Let's double down on this. And obviously they have with you bringing you into the business to do like you, – you created programs by state level. So you obviously can do it in a store, and it's obviously working really well because you text for there for 30-plus years. My goodness. Yeah. So that's awesome. And one other piece of what I do here, I, I don't just train the technicians. I, take, I train the service advisors as well. So they take classes from me, and I give them basic mechanical classes so that they can communicate to their customer, you know, Mm -hmm. you know what what we're telling them you know because it's pretty hard to tell somebody that uh, you know they got a burn valve uh, you know when you don't know what the heck a valve is you know um, <laughs> yes so, so we give them i give them those kind of trainings and i also give them you know customer service uh, classes because i have that in my background as well so um, you know so you know it, it, it it's it's a pretty unique thing we've got going on here and and hopefully it gets replicated all over the place that's 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 one of my uh, goals of our conversation here is mm -hmm. getting that word out that that this gets replicated in other places because this is 
this is what the industry is needing at especially at this time uh, if we want to attract those quality people into this industry and everybody's fighting for the same people the plumbers the electricians the offshoremen you know the pipe fitters we're all competing for those same hands-on people uh, that, uh, you know, that are out there looking for something other than a four-year degree. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to have something to offer them. And the automotive industry, we've been so far behind in pay and compensation, you know, um, 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 not compensation. Um, Communication. Benef value, benefits benefits and things like benefits. that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so you know it's it's hard to compete. You know when we're going to hire somebody off the street for twenty bucks an hour uh, to 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 do a very physically demanding job that you have to you know spend you know fifteen thousand dollars just to be an entry level person on tools. Um, mm -hmm. and that's not even going to be adequate after the second week. Um, Hard to compete with that, where, you know, when when you you've got someone that's going into the electrician industry and uh, they're going to make thirty dollars an hour and it's going to they're going to spend fifteen hundred dollars and those tools will last them the rest of their life, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know. So case in point, my grandfather passed away a couple of years ago and I inherited all of his tools and I found I call them grandpa pliers, but uh, the pliers he used on everything. I don't even know, to be completely honest, they are such a, uh, I would say, a uh, electric focused, electrician focused kind of plier that I would never have bought them as a mechanic ever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But they have 1972 or something like that inscribed on, if I forget, they're early 70s pliers. Mm -hmm. And he's had them retaped a couple of times. Um, he's had them regripped. Uh, I, I remember them. And then they had like, Buying a pair of pliers once, having a carry toolbox for decades and never needing to buy more. You buy more supplies. Mm -hmm. And if you break something, you replace it. But yeah, 15, like uh, I recall a conversation I had a, probably about a year ago after a piece of content we published and an electrician, you know, friend of mine is like, oh, we don't spend $50. We spend way more than that. It's like, okay, let's, let's go to your truck. And let's have a look what's in your truck. He owns his own business. Okay, he's an electrician, owns his own business, electrician contractor or something somewhere in the in here. And he's going through all the expenses. Okay, well, that's supplies. That supplies. That supplies. That supplies. Consumable supplies. Safety. Okay. Safety. That's that's fine, but that's that's okay. That's not a tool. Where's your tools? Okay, well, this is my tools. Okay, go through the tools. And I think. Um, from his point of view, I think he ha might have had five grand, maybe yeah. it, it was somewhere like between four and five and he employed people. So he had apprentices using those same tools. So he bought a few more tools. So he had duplicates of things for sure to make sure the apprentices had tools. He had a duplicate, you know, hang bags for the hips and stuff like that. So five grand, 30 years or 25 years, I think he'd been in the, the industry at the time. Like it's not 50. And it's definitely not a hundred. I know Marshall, Richard, Stefan, all the three of them. We've had this conversation. Zach's uh, got his toolboxes boxes at home, like hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of tools, and some of them stop being used after twenty years. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So not the same. It's not the same as a college degree. It's not the same as any of those kinds of things. And like we're talking about training is never ending yep. yep yep never ending as far as i understand especially with my grandfather being a journeyman electrician their base education doesn't really need to update almost at all the thing they need to stay current on is new forms of wire new and new regulation yeah <laughs> I'm sorry, we get a new product model every year. Yep. Sometimes every half year when they do half model year updates and all of a sudden the paneling is different, so the clips might be different and the process to take it off and put it back on is different. Yep. Sometimes they completely change something halfway through a model cycle and guess what? There are more than one brand and they all love to do something a little bit differently, which yep. means yes, the fundamentals are somewhat the same, but everything else is different. Yeah. So 
Um, yes, we're actively completing with plumbers and electricians for not only the folks that want to do hands on, but want to be challenged. They want to be appropriately communicated with, appropriately trained, appropriately resourced, appropriately supported, and so on and so forth. So that would lead me to to we've got lots more we can talk about, but I want to make sure that we we get this tidbit out. Yeah, because you've got so much time in and you've done so much over your career. What is your one, say, linchpin piece of advice to give a technician out there to be happier, healthier, more productive? You have to love what you're doing. You know, if if you don't love what you're doing, going to work is a drag. And uh, I've I've been really fortunate because I have always loved what I'm doing. And so, you know, I, I could be retired. I'm, I, I'll be 68 years old here in a, in a couple months. I could be retired, but I am having too much fun. The cars are the coolest cars that have ever been built. They're the most fun to diagnose. Yeah, they can be really frustrating. Man, they throw you some curveballs now. Um, but, oh, man, you got to love what you're doing. If if you don't love what you're doing, it, it's it's a drag, and uh, and so if you don't find something that you do love, so um, now let me let me try let me let me segue this a little bit here. Okay. So I come across this regularly. I don't love this anymore. You know, I got into cars because I love them. It's a very common phrase on the show. This is why they got into cars. Um, whether they, they're mechanics or not, they could be automotive recruiters. They could be, it could be anybody. They, they loved cars and got into automotive because they loved cars. And now that they've been working on cars all day long, they've kind of fallen out of love with them a bit. It's become a job. It's become taxing. And one of the things I suggest these same folks that tell me that, that they've fallen out of love, I, I regularly tell them it means not necessarily that you need to leave the industry, mm -hmm. but maybe. Maybe you either need to specialize in what you're doing because maybe you're working too broadly. And this is where, you know, I've made content about bumper to bumper versus specialties and so on and so forth. Um, maybe you need to specialize. Maybe to find, find the, the thing that you love the, to do the most. Maybe you don't love it right now, but maybe if you did it all day long every day, maybe that's the thing that could bring you back into love with the industry or, or your role in life on the shop floor. or Perhaps it's the step up, shop foreman, senior senior uh, technician or team lead. Maybe it's trainer in your shop. Maybe it's service manager or fixed ops director. Maybe it's not that you've fallen out of the love of the industry. It's that you're not doing the thing that satisfies your soul the most. Yeah. And it may not necessarily mean you need to leave the industry, but you just need to kind of spend some time and figure it out and not necessarily just say, I don't love it anymore. Right. What is a what would be something that you would say to help? Like I'm I'm saying, maybe specialize or get promoted. What would be something you would say that they need to do to maybe fall back in love with automotive? Well, I, I think you know this this goes right along with what you're saying. It, you need to assess what it is that caused you to fall out of love in you know in the first place. Is it is it uh, is it a physical problem? You're 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 physically worn out. Um, is it maybe you're not you you've spent too much time in a shop. You know you might need to you you might need to move because it's no longer a good fit. Because um, quite often that's that's what the problem is. We lumber along in a place that never never appreciated us didn't pay us well, didn't train us well, and so we just get all grumpy and stuff. And uh, sometimes you, you have to move. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've had to do that a couple times in my career, that, uh, you know, the, 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 the shop, I guess, didn't appreciate me uh, and my talents and uh, either tried to pigeonhole me in one type of thing, um, uh, uh, you know those kind of things. So I th it's you. You need to assess because everybody's going to be different. It's going to be a different reason why you've fallen out of love. Um, it might have just been a bad choice in the first place too. But but typically that person that's been doing it for ten or fifteen years, um, it was a good choice. Um, mm -hmm. You just need to reassess and um, and and is that something you guys are doing at your store as well? Because one of the big big proponents that I'm when it comes to training is, is training is if it's not 
in addition to some form of coaching or some form of regular interaction beyond the training itself, the training isn't remembered and utilized and taken to the next step. And is that something that you're doing as well as part of the training at the store? Is that something you're making sure that, you know, maybe their love of what they're doing currently is, is decreasing. So you got to make sure that they're engaged. Is that something that you're doing? Yeah. And, and one of the things that we do, especially with our experienced techs is we really try to leverage them with our, you know, apprentice techs or those, or those ones that are just out of apprenticeship. And this is another place where we've got a pretty unique group of guys down there um, uh, that they, you know, they are willing to share their knowledge and their secrets. You know, mm -hmm. you always have that guy in the shop that just wants to be left alone in the corner. That's okay. You can leave him alone in the corner. But, um, but, uh, you know, once you get them, you know, that, especially that older tech, if you get them teamed up where they're actually coaching that new person, you, you can see that spark and that flame get, you know, built back up because now they're helping someone else be successful. And so mm -hmm. figuring out how to leverage that um, and, uh, and you know, carefully choosing the right people because, uh, you know, you choose the wrong mentor and, and you could ruin a, a really good, you know, potential candidate to be a, a mm -hmm. technician. So uh, making sure you pick the right person. Uh, you know, we've got there, we've got one guy downstairs, great technician, but uh, you know, I'm not going to have him mentoring anyone. He's he's one Fair of those guys. Like, there's there's people who do well with it and people who don't. Like right. Marshall Sheldon, you know, I love him, my brother, and he he's. One of his things that helped him rekindle his fire for the trade is becoming a mentor yeah. and really spending an extra time, energy, and effort on becoming becoming a mentor and then becoming a better mentor and and teaching new folks what the industry is, how to how to be, how to win, how to be a killer. Yeah. And you know, to that next step, one of the phrases I use commonly, and I, I don't remember who said it first, but you are not a leader until you've created a leader who can create a leader themselves yeah. until you have made it so that you are no longer necessary as part of the equation. Not until that time, are you a true leader? Yeah. So he's doing that. Mm -hmm. As far as I understand, he's, if I remember the story correctly and Marshall, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but he has technicians that he's trained now training. And that feeling from my point of view, after nearly 25 years in on and around the industry, that's a great feeling. Yeah. That's a great yep. feeling. That's, yep. that's not just legacy in your family. That's legacy, legacy in your hands, your hard work, your blood, your sweat, every single day, the slog. It, it is a wonderful feeling yeah. um, that only a few truly get to experience because they don't necessarily know that it's possible. And I'm really happy to hear that your store is is doubling down on that very fact yeah yeah and you know it's a it's a tricky balancing act in a flat rate shop you know mm -hmm. because when that when that that experienced tech is spending time with that that uh you know that mentee you know that apprentice um they're losing money potentially so so you have to figure out a way to help with that. Um, you know, the apprenticeship program that I help set up and run, um, what some of my uh, shops did was the, the, um, the mentor got to flag the hours that the apprentice was, was uh, producing. Um, the, the, the apprentice was an hourly person and um, any hours that he flagged got to go to the mentor. Um, so that he got compensated. Some of my other dealers, uh, you know, shops um, uh, gave a stipend to the to the mentor, um, you know, that experienced tech to compensate him for the time that he's going to lose. But mm -hmm. the, the the really interesting thing that I found um, was that after about it, it usually took about three months. Usually that mentors. Uh, uh, productivity went up and his comeback weight rate went down. And I'm talking about the mentor. I'm talking about the, the, um, 
the, 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 the experienced tech that's mentoring the apprentice. His productivity went up and his comeback rate went down because now he's more careful about what he's doing because he's got this apprentice watching over his shoulder. And I thought that was a wow. really good thing. I had never thought in a million years about that. It's that's only something you're going to get by actually doing that in the store and starting to track that stuff. Right, right. I had never put those two into two together. That's not. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Pretty, pretty. It was a, it was a pretty cool uh, thing that I discovered there. So hopefully that's, it happens everywhere. So you're 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 basically that is the the objective manifestation is as do as I do, not as I say, but actually now I have to say what I do. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Pretty cool. Huh? Wow. Yeah. On that bombshell, that is, that is a great way to end this episode. Folks, you better be taking notes. If you haven't been taking notes, you need to take notes or watch the show again or listen to the show again, because my goodness, Wayne, my goodness. Oh my goodness. That. Okay. Okay. I got to, we're, we're good. We're good. Wayne, uh, thank you very much for your time. I really, really, really appreciate it. There is so many nuggets in there. There are so many stores, so many leaders, so many technicians could take so much. My goodness, thank you. Well, you're welcome. And uh, maybe we need to do this again sometime because there's a whole lot more we can talk about. So it sounds like that we need to. It sounds like that we need to. So, folks, I think that's the end of another episode. Uh, I really hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Wrench Turners Podcast. I really hope that you subscribe and share this episode of the Wrench Turners Podcast. And as we always end the show, Wayne, we're going to end with a quote. And I think um, <laughs> I love how this works out every time. I try and find a quote that I think will work well or how I, however I feel in the day. And we've talked about what it's like by building uh, uh, basically an in-house training facility, talking about the future of building from within. And the quote that I came up with before we started recording today, Wayne, is where there is no vision, there is no hope. My goodness, George Washington Carver had it right. Yeah. Folks, remember, negative pushes, positive pulls, and always clean your toys before you put them away. Perfect. Perfect.